Welcome, it's nice to have you here. So momentarily we can get started with the topic for today, which is a very simple topic and a very powerful topic that will help you greatly with whatever it is that you want in your life. Whether what you want is to have greater success in something materially or spiritually. It's a fundamental thing that will be very helpful. And it's not something that uh, many people give a lot of attention to, but it perhaps for that reason is very important to understand because Without this, it's very difficult to be successful in anything. So we'll get to that momentarily. To begin with, though, as those of you who are here live know, this is this meeting is called Relax into Health, Wealth, and Happiness. And I always like to take a moment at the beginning to review some basics about the meeting, what the intention is, what the benefits are and how you can best receive the benefits. So the intention of the meeting is to support self-realization and self-realization means as the term implies, it means to know yourself and who you are is a multi-dimensional being. So and you cannot understand yourself with your mind, at least not entirely, uh, because you your mind is one dimension of you. So the single single dimension cannot understand the totality, but you are that totality. And so you have the ability to understand yourself, but it's beyond the mind. So, you are the what can be understood. You are what is beyond what can be understood, but you are that totality. And so that is what you want to realize. That is what you want to know, because that gives you the true satisfaction that you desire. So that's the benefit of self-realization is that then you actually experience the fulfillment of your purpose. You experience lasting satisfaction, satisfaction that is not tied to something transient. So most of the things, most of the types of satisfaction that we experience are not what I'm talking about when I talk about true satisfaction, because the kinds of satisfaction that we experience are connected to transient things. And so those so-called satisfactions also are transient. And you've probably noticed that when you experience satisfaction, if you ever experience satisfaction, it's hard to say that it ever actually happens. It's like you're leading up to it, and then it seems to happen, but then it's, but then you're, next thing you know, you're looking for the next thing. And so the actual satisfaction, if we really tell the truth, it never really actually happens. Because we tend to just jump from one seeking to the next. Because we constantly have this idea that we're going to get the lasting fulfillment in the next thing. But it's a deception because as I've already pointed out, we never actually get it. We get this, there's an implication of a satisfaction, but the actual satisfaction can't be found. We get so close to it and then we're on the other side of it. It's, it we're getting closer, 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 and then 
almost there. And then the next thing is past. And then we're looking for the next thing. So the kind of satisfaction that I'm talking about is a satisfaction that's not connected to or tied to or dependent upon anything transitory. It's not about achieving something. It's about realizing something. It's about knowing who you are because you are the source of the true satisfaction that you seek. I mean, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice not to be seeking for something, not to be craving for something, but to actually experience what the craving is always promising. And again, that's found in who you are. Really, it shouldn't come as a surprise. I say that, I don't know, maybe it depends on your level of consciousness, I guess. You know, at a certain level of consciousness, um, then this is all clear. At other levels of consciousness, it may not be clear. So, but maybe it's possible for it to be clear to you. So I'll point it out and then you might see what it is for yourself, in which case that will be very lovely for you. So just notice that every desire has in it already a promise of fulfillment. That's why you desire. We often think that the desire is about the thing, the object of desire, because that idea comes to us. We say, oh, wouldn't it be so lovely to have a million dollars? And then we think, oh, yes, if I had a million dollars, then I would be so happy. So our focus gets goes to the million dollars. And we say, oh, if I had a million dollars, just had a million dollars, that's my true satisfaction. But if we pause and just take a step back for a moment, we can notice that what's actually driving this? What, why would you be seeking after the million dollars? Because actually, if you tell the truth, a million dollars can't do anything for you. What it is that you're actually wanting is the satisfaction or the fulfillment that you believe that the million dollars will give you. So notice that first. It's what you're seeking is the sense of fulfillment. Because that fulfillment is a sense of peace, it's a sense of okayness. You're not actually being... Uh, it's a sense of freedom, really, because if you notice, like I've already pointed out, most of most people's lives is a kind of slavery to the next seeking. But in that one moment, which, as I've hinted or pointed out, it doesn't actually ever arrive, but there's a hint, there's an implication of it in that one instant. There's a, there's a glimpse of true freedom because in that one instant which is outside of time outside of the seeking independent of all of the seeking and the objects of of the desire that one instant there's peace there's no craving there's no sense of lack there's peace so that is what we're actually desiring um, so notice, we think that we want the thing that we think we want. We think we want the million dollars or the new spouse or the new car or the new career or the better body or the whatever it is. And that's all fine. It's not a problem inherently. It, it can become a problem, but it's not inherently a problem. But, um, but if we take a step back and tell the truth about it, we might notice that what we really want is not any of those things because none of those things actually can give us anything that we really want. All of those things are, um, they're always out of reach. You know, it's like, what are you going to do with a million dollars? You might have all kinds of ideas about what you do with a million dollars, but whatever the things you might do with a million dollars, none of those things will ever actually be you'll never actually be able to actually touch them. They're always at a distance, no matter how close they are. You know, you can take the million dollars and rub it all over your face, but it's always at a distance. It's never quite, 
you. So the million dollars and the spouse and the car and the, all the things that we think we want, they will always be at a distance. They won't give us what we really want. And that's not a problem because what we really want is that satisfaction, that peace that we get a glimpse of, or we hope we'll get a glimpse of when we achieve the thing. So we think if I have a million dollars, then I'll be so happy. Well, what you want is the happiness. The happiness is not a, is not a, uh, an outcome of a million dollars, the happiness is 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 independent. And the happiness, which is what you want, is actually available to you. The million dollars is not. The million dollars will always be a little bit at a distance. But the thing that you actually want is available to you. It's very intimately available to you. So what it is that you want, that happiness, peace, fulfillment, we can call it by many names. What that actually is, is that's you. That's the self. And so this is the thing, the point that I was suggesting that it, you may be able to recognize this depending on your present level of consciousness. So I'll point it out to you. That's already present prior to and inherent in the desire itself. So just notice the desire emerges there's a moment before the desire, but then the desire emerges. What is the source of the desire? Notice that the source of the desire is already its fulfillment. The only reason why it could, could be so attractive is because of what it's promising, because of its fulfillment. But that fulfillment can't be in the future. It has to be now. Why am I saying this? This is the part that may or may not be clear to you, but just take a look and see if you can see this. If you didn't already know that fulfillment, if you didn't already know what's promised by the desire, you wouldn't be at all attracted to it because you would have no reference point at all to understand it. It would, you know, if somebody says, hey, you want to go to Andromeda? Yeah. Why? Why would you go to Andromeda? You don't know anything about it. You've never had that experience. It's not interesting to you. It's nothing attractive about it at all. But when you've had, when you have the experience, somebody says, you know, maybe you've been to, I don't know, somewhere that you think is nice. And somebody says, you want to go there? And you say, oh yeah, that would be lovely. Why? Because you have had that experience. So you have to have that reference point in order for it to be attractive to you. Now, of course, you could project onto something you haven't pr previously experienced, something that you already have experienced. But the point I'm making still applies because it's the projection of what you already have experienced that is the attraction. So the desire already emerges from its fulfillment. That's that can't be otherwise. Otherwise, the desire couldn't exist. It only exists as a desire because it had because it emerges from its own fulfillment, which means you are that. You are attracted to it because it's already pointing you to something that is already known, that is supremely attractive. That's why you're drawn to it, like a moth to a flame. But the mistake that we make then is in thinking that the, the thing that we think, that the object of the desire is going to give us the fulfillment, but the object of the desire, as I've already pointed out, it can't because you can't ever actually have it. But what is possible is to have that which already is the fulfillment, which is prior to, during, and after the desire, because the desire arises from that, and it exists in that, and it merges with that. And that is you. You are that fulfillment. Now, how can you know that that's true? Well, you just look and see. You just see that when, when you have a desire, notice there's already, you're, you're already fantasizing about what it will be like when you achieve that. And how do you know that that's attractive? Because it feels good. Well, where is that 
good feeling. It's already here. You already know it. And you know it because you are that. But what happens is within the framework of the desire, because our attention is given you know, in a very particular way, which is limited because we limit it with belief. We say, oh, you know, there are certain conditions for this. Oh, it will be so nice. I can already imagine what it will be like. Oh, it's so lovely and delightful. But we're overlooking that that's already complete, already presently. And But we then give our attention to this limited version in fantasy. We say, oh, in the future, when these conditions are met, that's going to be so lovely. So we limit ourselves because we give our attention to that limited version. Okay, so that was a bit of a diversion, not too much of a diversion, but back to the point here is it's the, the benefit of what's available through this meeting is that, to realize that you already are that and to real to realize that fully, which means that you can begin to live your life from that satisfaction, realizing that, that satisfaction is independent of any conditions. So the conditions come and go because the conditions do come and go. That's the nature of the conditions is they come and go. So sometimes the evaluation of the conditions will be that this is good, and sometimes the evaluation of the conditions will be that this is bad. But the, the, the common thread in all the conditions is that they're changing. So what is good will be bad, and what is bad will be good, and it will continue to change like that because that's what happens. The sun rises, the sun sets. You know, the day the sun ceases to rise and set is the day that it's over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so like, as long as there's life happening, there's change taking place. But so, and I'm pointing this out because otherwise we think, oh, this sounds so lovely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become self-realized in the future. And we just do the same thing. Oh, it's going to be what it's going to be like. Oh, that's going to be so nice when those conditions are met. And then you have the, you're imagining certain conditions. Oh, well, you know, I won't experience this and I won't experience that and I'll only experience these kinds of things and people will always be pleasant around me and I won't ever have any discomforts and I won't ever have any negative thoughts and yada, yada, yada. But why do that to yourself? Because when you do that to yourself, again, you're fantasizing and putting your attention on something that's limited. You're saying, oh, that thing that's limited I'm, that's going to be the thing that in the future is going to be so nice. But that never arrives. Uh, but what you can discover and what I'm pointing to and what's available through this meeting is an invitation to discover that which is ever present, which is the actual fulfillment, and that is you. And so that's not conditional. So what does that mean? It means Whatever happens, whatever conditions come and go, this is unchanging. And this is the tricky bit. Um, Maybe many tricky bits, but this is a tricky bit, is we are so much in the habit of the imagining the conditions uh, that we have to, the work is really in letting go of the conditions and accepting the unconditional. And the mind will reject this on so many levels and say, well, but that can't be really very nice. You know, I don't like all the unpleasant things. And if I had just accept the unpleasant things, then that's not really good. I don't like that at all. So I'll just keep projecting into the future this limited fantasy, this conditional fantasy, because somehow that seems better than accepting the eternal fulfillment, which is already here. It's just a little twist in the mind, but it's very persuasive. So we can just keep seeing that that the deception that we've been doing to ourselves is not all, is not giving us what it's promising. It's promising fulfillment, but we never get that fulfillment. So the I'll suggest more intelligent thing to do is to start to look at it differently. And as I'm pointing out, to start to see that the 
fulfillment that we desire is already here. It's here prior to the arising of the desire. And as I've already said, it has to be because otherwise you couldn't be attracted. The desire has to exist from that fulfillment. Otherwise, there is no desire. The very nature of the desire is that it emerges from its own fulfillment and it returns to its own fulfillment. And so if we want the fast track to fulfillment, we don't leave the fulfillment. <laughs> you know, that's the thing is just see that, okay, so there's this movement that's happening because that's the nature of this manifest reality. And the only mistake is then when we follow it and we say, oh yeah, that's going to give it to me. Instead of realizing I already have it, I already am it. So we can just keep noticing that the fulfillment is already here. So the movement happens. Let the movement happen. We don't need to stop the movement that we won't. Um, so don't bother. Again, there will be movement. Sometimes we will judge it as good. Sometimes we will judge it as bad. Sometimes we will say this is lovely. Sometimes we will say it is awful. But that's secondary because what we want to notice is that the fulfillment is already always here. And whether, and you, you might have arguments with that, you know, that's a possibility, but also consider this. If it was otherwise, it you wouldn't, this is the only thing that can be acceptable to you anyway, because otherwise you're, it, Anything else is hell. Um, what you want, the only thing that will actually really truly be acceptable to you is that which is eternal. Otherwise, you're just, it's a setup for anxiety. So you just want to see that that's true. So just act as if it's true and just look to see how it might be true and you will discover that it is true. So that's what the what the intention is, what the benefit is. I mean, I don't know if that's a I'm if I talk any more about the benefit, we'll just that will be the end of the meeting. So I'll continue on to there's much more that could be said about the benefit, but we'll say next um how to maximize your uh receiving of the benefits during the meeting, after the meeting, in your life, which is in the name of the meeting itself, which is to relax into health, wealth, and happiness. So this relaxation is an active relaxation. It's not about going to sleep. It's not about numbing yourself. It's not about your idea of comfort, but it's about discovering a much deeper comfort uh, through presence. So noticing that you can be aware. So most of us, most of the time, are uh, doing little more than reacting unconsciously and calling that consciousness. It's not conscious at all. It, you were asleep and we're calling it wakefulness. And until you actually start to see the truth of that, you can't understand it at all. It seems insane, but it's true. It's been pointed out by many, many people over long periods of time. It's in scriptures. So I'm not just pulling this out of a hat. This is something that many very wise people have observed. And I took their advice and I looked for myself and I can report that it is true and I'm just inviting you to look and see the same. So we think that we're awake when in fact we're asleep. All Everything that is going on that we mistake to be ourselves, with little exception, is in fact just unconscious reaction. It is a dream that is happening almost entirely unconsciously. And um, you can liken it to a, a dream at night. So you're 
in your bed, sleeping, dreaming. And while you're dreaming, unless it's a lucid dream, which is rare, relatively, then you think that in the dream, you believe that you are awake. But after you wake up, you realize that you were asleep. So everything that's happening in the dream and all of your reactions to the dream are just unconscious. It's just, you can distinguish from that uh, a lucid dream in which there's a, an awareness that it's a dream, in which case you know that none of what's happening there has anything to do with you in the sense that um, that's not quite the right way of putting it. it. It does have something to do with you. It's a it's a it's a reflection of what you're holding to be true in consciousness. It's a reflection of your beliefs and perceptions. But but you are independent of it. So you, as a we'll call it a soul, as that which is um, truly a non-material being as a as consciousness you are unaffected by whatever happens in the dream obviously we know this is true also even of the waking state character relative to the dream state character because there there also is an independence so if you win the lottery in the dream when you wake up your bank account is the same as when you went to sleep more, relatively more or less right it's, if you won 34 million dollars in the dream you don't suddenly have $34 million in your bank account, or you don't have an additional $34 million in your bank account, whatever. Um, so the, the, the one who is aware of the dream is independent of the, the content of the dream. So only when you're awake do you have that knowledge. Otherwise, you're asleep, but you think you're awake. And so in a similar way, in the waking state, we think that we're awake, but in fact, we're almost always entirely asleep. And what I mean by that is, in a parallel sense, if you think that you are dependent uh, on all of the things or some of the things, many of the things that are happening in the waking state, then you're asleep. And so... Um, So this relaxation that I'm talking about is about being awake, present, and differentiating, being able to distinguish between what comes and goes and what does not, noticing that you are that which is continuous. You are that which is aware. You are that which is independent. You are that which is unaffected by the content of this experience. So sometimes that content is very, seemingly very persuasive, but this active relaxation is just to continue to consciously relax and let go and just continue to notice, to be aware. You know, the power of the, of the dream whether it's a nighttime dream or a waking dream, is very persuasive. There's a story that I've told before. I don't remember where uh, the story came from. But it's a story about um, these two characters, Krishna and Narada. So Narada is a celestial being, a celestial being and and uh, and krishna is uh, is is the supreme being and they're walking along together and narada says krishna i want you to tell me about uh i want you to teach me about your power of maya so maya is the this power of persuasion uh of the dream and krishna says oh no you don't you don't want me to do that. Ask for something else. And Narada says, no, I do. And he says, well, then, if you're sure. And he says, oh, I'm sure. That, well, I'm thirsty. So before we begin, would you please go get me some water from the 
next village up ahead. I'll wait here. So Narada goes up ahead and he goes up to the well in the village and uh, he meets a young woman who's standing at the well. He falls in love with her and uh, they get married and they have children and their children have children. And so obviously many years have passed and one day a great flood comes along and uh, wipes out everything in the village and uh, everyone perishes except for Narada. He's the only survivor. And so then he's, you know, heartbroken and he just begins to wander. And then he happens upon Krishna and Krishna says, what's taking you so long? <laughs> so this is the persuasive power of Maya. So if we are caught up in all of the things, then we don't know. You know, it's like we didn't realize that we had, we, we are Narada, who we, we have asked, to, you know, we said, Krishna, I want to know about the, your power of Maya. And Krishna says, you don't want to know about that. Ask something else. And we foolishly or otherwise said, no, I really want to know. <laughs> and we walked ahead and got the, you know, went to the well to get the water. And here we are. And so it continues to persuade us very strongly, um, but we're we're wanting to wake up. And so, you know, that's why you're here. You wouldn't be here otherwise. That's, that's the nature of this whole thing. Like that's the power of intention. The intention of this meeting is self-realization. Only the people who are sincerely interested will find their way here. You don't know how you found your way here. I mean, if you think back, you, how on earth did it happen? It's a strange thing. But you you happened upon this because there's a, because that's what you really want. You have that intention also. So um, this, this meeting happens and here we are. And so the invitation, how you can receive the benefits is through this active relaxation. So you have to actually slow down within yourself and you have to start to consciously let go and notice that everything that's happening is happening. It's coming and going. So it's all the, it's all Maya. All of this, your thoughts, your feelings, emotions, sensations, the colors, the sounds, the meanings, the shapes, all of it. And when you slow down in, internally and you consciously let go and relax, you start to notice that. You start to notice there's more space there than you thought. There's There are more gaps than you thought. And so this starts to allow you to notice that underlying satisfaction. Remember, all of the desires, all of the movement, all of the maya, all of the activity is arising from that fulfillment which is eternal, which is you. When you slow down and you notice what's happening as it is, then you start to notice that there are gaps. You start to notice that everything is emerging from something and this something you start to notice is very attractive and it's very close. The more you relax in this way, the more you notice that it's already here. And it's not something you can get. You don't need to go anywhere to get it. You don't need to, to do anything to get it. No amount of effort will give it to you or bring you any closer to it. In fact, the more you try, the 
more out of reach it seems to be. You chase after it. It's like a mirage. It's always just slightly up ahead. But the more you relax, the more you discover that it's already here. So this is the act of relaxation. Do that during this meeting. Do it during your life. And you'll see it's very satisfying. So now for the topic of today's meeting, which is the power of focus. <laughs> so whatever you want, whether you, whether it's spiritual or material, uh, your ability to focus is directly proportional to your success. So remember that I pointed out that everything is emerging from this fulfillment, from the self, from the source. And it has its existence in the source, and then it returns to the source. That's just the nature of what's going on. You don't have to take my word for it. You can just look and be curious and see the truth of that for yourself. You can just see that your entire experience, even though much of it you might be in the habit of believing is external to you, in truth, all of your experience is happening presently, here now, directly, intimately, in you, as you. There is nothing else. Everything that you are perceiving is actually a perception happening here and now in you as you. The thought says it's out there, but the reality is it's experienced here. The color, the shape, the sound, the sensation, all of it is experienced here now. So... <clears throat> We can then just start to observe and see that all of this, all of this vibration, so as I've often pointed out, that all of this perception, all of the sens sensory experience and all of the thoughts, which, which is to say everything that we experience, is a vibration. Color is vibration. Sound is vibration. Thoughts are vibration. It's all vibration. If you have the right instruments, you can measure it. And so um, the nature of vibration is it's in motion. And we can, if we were to visually represent a vibration, we would represent it as a wave. So it's rising and falling, rising and falling. So the rising and falling what is it rising from and what does it fall into? So there's a moment before the thing is, and then it exists, and then there's a moment in which it disappears. So this is a fundamental quality of all things that's been observed by people who've chosen to observe it for all eternity, right? They've noticed and they've given different names and descriptions to this, but it's fundamentally is a three-part nature to all things, is that there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, you know, that seems like, oh boy, that's, tell me something I don't know. But it it's very profound if you actually observe it in your direct experience, because then you start to notice, well, that means that everything, and and this is true. You just see everything has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So what is prior to the beginning? What is after the end? And what happens to that in the middle? So you start to actually be curious about this, and you can just directly observe it in your own experience. So you just watch for the next thought, for example. And you'll notice that the prior to the thought, there's a thoughtlessness, right? There's a, we call it a field of no thought. 
And the thought appears, so that's the beginning, and then it has some sustenance, and then it disappears. So beginning, middle, end. And after the end, same thoughtlessness, same field from which thoughts emerge. So there's this field, we'll call it a field, and the thought emerges and then merges. And so, you know, what happens to the field? Well, we can actually observe and see that the field is continuous. So the field remains, it's full of potential. Any thought can emerge from it, but only one thought emerges at a time, but any thought could emerge. So this, we can start to notice that there's this continuity of this field and we can generalize it. It's because it's not just the field of thought, it's the field of sensation, it's the field of light, it's the field of, of all things, all experience, all perception, all anything that could happen emerges from this field. So it's, we call it a field of consciousness or whatever, it doesn't really have a name, but just to describe it as something, we call it various things. Okay, so now, if something emerges, uh, which it sometimes does, remember it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So all things have a beginning, middle, and an end. We're not gonna, we're not gonna, uh, that, that's just the, the nature of it. But what determines the middle and the end, right? So the in a sense, the beginning is a prerequisite for the middle and the middle is a prerequisite for the end, right? You have to have a beginning before the middle and then the middle has to complete before the end. So I know that it seems like too stupid, but it, there's, there's <laughs> something here. So, the middle, okay, is actually what we're using. When we talk about the thing, that's what we're really usually talking about, right? We're actually usually interested in the middle. Um, and if we, if it's a thing we like, then we really want the, we want that the middle to be sustained. And if it's a thing we don't like, we want the middle to be cut short. <laughs> we want, you know, want the end to come. But normally we don't really realize that we have any power in that. We're just sort of crossing our fingers and hoping but that doesn't give us good results. We we get better results when we actually have direct perception, awareness of what's really going on. And then we have the ability to do something because it's only when we have the knowledge that we can actually do something. Uh, right before that, it's all at best it's superstition, which tends to give poor results. Pretty much. <laughs> but the actual knowledge can give us very good results. So that's why I'm saying it seems like what could be the value in saying that things have a beginning, middle, and end, but just see that, that, that there is value in it. And it has to do, and part of what's important here is our ability to focus. So normally we don't have a, we, we have not cultivated our ability to focus. And consequently, when something, uh, happens then it happens and that's it that's all we can say about it because our attention will go to the next thing that happens this thing will happen it will have a beginning middle end then the next thing will happen and it will have a beginning middle and an end and the next thing will happen a beginning middle and an end and that will just continue and our attention just goes it's just oh shiny new thing oh oh shiny new thing oh and that just keeps happening over and over. And we say, oh, I hope the next thing is, the next shiny new thing is going to be a nice shiny new thing and not a terrible thing. That's where the superstition comes from. But if we have, if we cultivate our ability to focus, then we can start to do something interesting. 
we can actually start to play with the nature of things should we want to. And this has to do with, at a material level, this is a benefit, right? Because we want to have nice lives. We want to have, we, we want to experience nice things. We don't want to be afraid of negative things. But if we are ignorant of what's actually going on, and if we don't have the good, the right skills properly developed, then we're going to struggle in, with the same things. So we want to develop this ability to focus because this is going to help us so that materially we can then begin to, there's multiple levels to this. We'll start at one level. So something nice happens. Wouldn't it be nice then to be able to sustain it? Like a nice mood comes. You feel good. Wouldn't it be nice to sustain it? And how can you do that? By keeping your attention on it. Notice what happens. It comes upon you, you feel good, and it's there for a while, and then something else appears. Maybe a worry appears. And your attention goes to that, and all of a sudden, your good mood has gone away. And now your attention is with the worry because you don't know how to keep your attention with what you want. Your attention just goes to whatever's there. So your ability to keep your attention on one thing helps you in this way because you can keep your attention on what you want. One benefit. Another thing, another benefit, at a subtler level, you can actually start to choose to place your attention or withdraw your attention at subtler and subtler levels so that you waste less time and energy on those things which are not in alignment with what you want. Because there's so much out of habit, there's just so many things that appear that we haven't had enough clarity on, and so the habit remains. It's not, you know, like there's a habit of worry, as an example. Who doesn't worry? So there's a habit of worry. And that habit is going to continue until you have sufficient clarity and ability to um, focus in a way that allows you to effectively dismiss it. So, because what happens is the worry comes and you don't recognize it early enough. So, you know, it's, uh, the, there's this field of consciousness again, and well, it's nothingness. It's full of potential, but it's nothing. It's not differentiated. And then it, something begins to emerge. It's so subtle that we don't notice it right away. And then it it grows and grows and grows and grows. And it's only when it gets to a certain threshold, then we say, oh, now I'm aware of it. And it's, oh, I'm worrying. And by that point, you're just worrying. You don't know how to stop. But what if you were able to keep your attention, your focus at a subtler level so that you could notice it right away and you could say, oh, there's that worry. Nope. <laughs> when it's just like a tiny little speck, nope. That would be much more efficient. So our ability to focus allows us to keep our attention at a subtler level so we can notice things when they're subtler so we can start to have more efficiency. It's like pruning. You just, the, the habit might still be there, but at a subtle level, it's easy to dismiss, to say, oh, there's that habit I don't like before it grows into this bigger thing. Just not that. What is it that I do want? Oh, yes, that. Keep my attention there. So these are two ways of understanding the benefit at a material level of keeping your focus 
having having better focus. One is that you can keep your attention on what you do want, not being so easily distracted by other things. The other is that you can keep your attention at a subtler level so you can start to be more selective about what you where you place what content you choose to put your attention on. So that's at a material level. Hopefully that's clear what why that's beneficial. It will you'll feel better, you'll worry less, you'll have less conflict. I mean just take a look and see how much conflict and stress you experience as a result of your attention on things that are not what you want. Right? You give your attention to stressful thoughts, fearful thoughts, fearful fantasies, negative content all the time. And if you can instead keep your attention on what you want, or at the very least, just dismiss the things that you don't want at a subtle level before it grows, that will be much nicer for you, right? I hope that's clear. So now, spiritually, let's say, there's also a significant benefit because Remember, I said what you want, actually the fulfillment of your desire, is already present at, at the source. So normally we play this game where we chase after the thing, right? The desire arises, we follow it, and maybe maybe there's a you know a nice experience that we can sustain that's nice that's a nice thing to experience so we can develop that skill again by keeping our focus there so we can sustain that maybe indefinitely that would be very pleasant that's very nice but it will end all things that have a beginning ha do have an end so there's that and it's okay when we have sufficient clarity about who we are and the nature of reality. We don't really need to care that much. It's like, okay, nice, 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 nice. And, oh, okay, but that's all right, right? Because we didn't have a sense that my okayness depended upon an indefinite sustenance of that. It's like, okay, so now there's a little bit of a letdown, but it's acceptable. So there's that. But now, when we realize that the actual fulfillment of the desire is already present prior to the arising of the desire, then doesn't it make sense that we could experience greater satisfaction if we keep our attention closer to that? closer to the source rather than chasing after something what if we just stay at the fulfillment where the fulfillment is more complete this may be clear to you again it just depends on your level of consciousness so it may or may not be clear to you but just notice if you can see this in your own experience that the subtler the experience the subtler the experience the the greater it is, the richer it is, there's, it's, it's fuller. Uh, and so it turns out that actually the experience of the pleasure of that satisfaction is greater, closer to the source before it's more differentiated because the more differentiated it is, the more that's been removed. You know, it's more differentiated because it, it, there's more that it's not. But before it's so differentiated, there's less has been removed, so it's more complete. So there's so much richness there. So the fulfillment that's experienceable there is much greater. So if we can keep our attention, our focus there and experience that, it's very, very nice. And then, Eventually, what this is pointing us to is just why ever leave the why ever leave this com the complete to total fulfillment that's never differentiated at all, 
that's absolutely complete. Because the instant that it manifests, even though it's maybe extremely subtle, there's still something that's lacking by definition because it's differentiated, it's something that is not. And so even though you might have 99.9999999% complete, and that's a really wonderful satisfaction, it's never 100%. <laughs> so eventually you start to realize, well, gee, why leave 100%? So then in terms of spiritual benefit, I mean, you know, it's kind of a silly thing to distinguish, but just for the sake of conversation, we'll say for spiritual benefit, your ability to keep your, your focus on something, when you can keep your focus on that which is so subtle that there's not, it's not even a thing at all, then you have the ability to experience a hundred percent satisfaction, a hundred percent completeness. So that's the power of focus. And it's now noon, which means that that's the end. I'll just say one more thing about it because you might be wondering, well, okay, gee whiz, how do I do how do I develop focus? Um, I've already told you because you know it's 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 in the name of the meeting, relax relax into health, wealth, and happiness. So it's active relaxation. So you can observe your direct experience and just slow down. Just notice that there's all kinds of stuff happening and there's a lot of reactivity that's going on and you don't fight with it because you can't. I mean, by the time you're aware of it, it's already here. So fighting with it is just uh, gonna, it's like it's like mud, mud wrestling with a pig. You know, I've mentioned this before. You, eventually you find out he, he likes it. You know, so it's like, if you're fighting with what you don't, with, with your experiences, like it's a big waste of your time. That just keeps it going. Um, but if you just say, okay, whatever, here it is. Uh, there's reactivity going on. There's, I think I don't like this. I'm afraid. I'm worried. I'm whatever. Fine. Just, just accept it. Don't fight with it. But remember what you want. You, whatever it is that you want, and keep your attention on that. So you want peace. Keep your attention on peace. You want completeness keep your attention on completeness you want abundance just keep your attention on abundance whatever it is that you want keep your attention on that and just let everything else fall away no matter no matter what it is it's like um, siddhartha sitting under the bodhi tree and mara comes trying to drive him away from the tree mara is the tempter sort of like satan you know jesus in the desert same same kind of same kind of thing right it's like what are you doing sitting under this tree siddhartha you know look 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 at these beautiful women who i'm going to give to you they could be they could be your wives wouldn't that be wonderful he says no i'm gonna sit here <laughs> like nice try mara Almost got me, but no, I'm going to sit here. I don't remember what the second temptation was. The third, I think the third temptation is since the, the, this is the one that's most memorable to me because it's the one that I can most relate to. Is he sends the whole demon army after Siddhartha. You know, it's like the whole demon army is coming just to endlessly torture Siddhartha. And Siddhartha says, ooh, very, very, very persuasive, but nope, I'm going to sit here. <laughs> And so whatever, you know, you keep, you just have to know what you want. Siddhartha was really clear, you know, he'd done, I don't have the time to do it. I'll just tell very, very briefly for those who don't know, you know, he was born into luxuries. Father, the king wanted to prevent him from fulfilling the prophecy that was made during his birth that he would become a holy man. And uh, so he, he wanted to 
shield him from old age, sickness, and death, which he did up to a certain point. And then Siddhartha saw these things and he left uh, left the palace and he went and lived in the forest with these renunciates and stood on one leg and ate roots and was starving to death and had the realization that was not going to give him what he wanted. So he had to get clear on what he actually wanted. You know, sometimes we're doing things like Siddhartha thinking, oh, this is going to give me what I want, but we don't actually have sufficient clarity on what we want. And so we have to get to a certain point of maturity to realize I need to know what I really want. And so he got just clear enough to realize what I really want is something that I have to discover within myself. And I cannot find that if I'm moving here and there constantly, I have to be focused. So he, he vowed not to move until he realized it. And he sat under that tree. So that having that level of maturity and clarity is required to get to that point and then to actually follow through because then the temptations will continue, right? The things will come in our experience where the worry, the fear, the anxiety, the stress, all the things will come that will attempt to persuade us to move from, to move our focus from what we want. So I'm not saying you should go sit under a tree for 49 days or whatever it was that Siddhartha did. I'm saying that be unmoving within yourself. Keep your focus on what you want, whatever it is, whether it's material or spiritual, whatever it is, your ability to keep your focus on that determines your uh, ability to succeed. And so you can cultivate this by practice i mean it's like no big surprise I mean, it's not like a a trick to it everybody wants a trick i guess but it's a trick you know trick there are no real tricks or if there are tricks they're not really tricks there's there there are intelligent approaches and less intelligent approaches but fundamentally it's you just have to practice so you just have to have sufficient clarity about what you want and then keep your attention on it. And whatever else comes, you have to say, fine, but I'm putting my, keeping my attention on what I want. I'm keeping my attention on what I want because this thing has come along and my tendency is to jump ship and say, Ooh, I'll just put my attention on that. And how many times have you done it? A, a billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of times we all have and you know what the outcome is you don't you're just cultivating add so you want to cultivate focus because that's going to give you what you want because it is what you want so you because you what you want is what you you want just you just take my word for it what you want is just to have the focus on what you want <laughs> <laughs> and so you you just have to choose that so that's one thing um with that said are there some other maybe specific things that a person could do formally that would be helpful because that's great if if you can understand what i've just said and put that into practice it will work and that's the essence of it but getting to the point of understanding what that means and actually put it in a practice is quite a challenge in and of itself, as evidenced by Siddhartha, who had to stand on one leg eating roots for years, starving himself to death in the forest before he got to that point. So, you know, we can cut ourselves some slack. It's a challenging thing. Remember, you know, Narada and, and Krishna, it's like, that's the power of Maya. It is very persuasive. So we can cut ourselves some slack. We're up against a very uh it's this is a very challenging lesson and we asked for it you know we said i want to understand this teach me and so we're being taught that's what this is and we're and 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 it's ultimately for good it's not a bad thing it's not like a punishment or anything 
we're, it's a lesson that we asked for because we want that mastery, but we have to realize what we're doing, realize that this is the lesson that we're here for and apply ourselves to it. So, okay, with all that said, then what are the, are there other, other things that could be helpful in, in cultivating that? Well, yes, glad you asked. <laughs> um, so um, classically, the, you know, I mean, Meditation practices are enormously helpful. No big surprise because they are, by and large, they're helping you to cultivate focus. Um, I cannot vouch personally for all meditation techniques. I can only vouch for those that I have personally practiced. Um, but I, uh, so there may be many that are very effective. Um, but what I can say is, there's a pretty uh, fairly uh, broad consensus um, among those from many different traditions that breath awareness is very powerful. So no big surprise, I often advocate for breath awareness. Just keeping your attention on the breath, not trying to breathe in a particular way, but just keeping your attention on the breath, seeing if you can just keep your attention continuously on the breath and relax, it's very powerful. So I recommend doing that, do it formally. If you do it formally, then you know that you're actually doing it or not. If you say, I'm gonna do it informally, that's fine, it's great to do, but, um, and I encourage you to do that as well, just as often as possible throughout the day, but then it's hard to know whether you're actually being honest and doing it. Um, whereas if you just say, I'm going to do it for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, every morning, and you make that a, a habit, then you know whether you've done it or not. There's no question about it. You either did it or you didn't. And you can also more easily get a sense of how that's working and what the effects are, because day by day, you'll be able to, to notice the changes. So I recommend that. <clears throat> um, for th those who may find that too challenging, because it's um, it's more of an in inner focus. So inner focus is a little more advanced. Outer focus is a is a good stepping stone if you find breath awareness to be too difficult. Um, then an outer focus is a great practice. So the, it's a classic yogic practice called Trataka. And you just choose something and you keep your focus, your visual focus on it. You just, just have a relaxed gaze on the thing. Classically, it's a candle flame, but it could be something else. Or it could be, a, I guess it would classically be a candle flame or an idol uh, or, a, or some kind of... Um, or a yantra, perhaps. So, you know, if you were inclined towards that, you could practice with a candle flame with, you know, like fire safety in mind, um, or with an idol or a yantra, if you were so inclined. And if not, whatever, choose something to point on the wall, and whatever. And, I mean, probably one of the benefits of you know, the classic things that, it's practiced with is that those have mm, they they are going to encourage good results you know if like if you're so certain idols or yantras are uh, have been imbued with uh, positive consciousness let's say so keeping your focus on that is keeping your focus on positive consciousness uh candle flame fire in general it's transformative so it's very powerful for burning your negative tendencies and habits and things like that so you know these are there's reasons why these things have been classically chosen so i i would recommend those um but if you know if you want to stare at a point on the wall that's fine too I would recommend that you're 
be somewhat selective if, about what you're going to look at because if you're looking at something that you know you're looking at a uh, you just like as a stupid example if you were going to choose it you're going to like stare at facebook <laughs> you know it's like you know, you you don't want to be doing that that wouldn't be helpful it would be sort of like not aligned with with what you're wanting um so those are things that i can recommend you know beyond that is for those of you who many of you who are here live you are familiar with specific meditation techniques that i have recommended that require an, an initiation um from my teacher i those are more powerful but those are for people who are inclined towards towards such a thing so those are the options that i can recommend they give very good results That's it for today. Uh, for those who are alive, I'm happy to stand for Q&A. Let me end this recording.